think I'd like to begin on the back of that title by first of all apologizing, apologizing to everybody because obviously these are two massive subjects uh, that absolutely merit a webinar in and of their own right, and in fact several webinars. But rare is the occasion where we have the opportunity to interview and bring about a discussion and, and a conversation between three panelists as esteemed as those that we have with us today. So before I introduce them, let me just thank all of you for dialing in. Let me thank you for watching, if you're doing so. And also, if you're following this on the podcast, which will be post-produced, we thank you for doing that as well. I also want to thank my great and powerful colleague, Alan Langer, for coordinating this and Rosita Panini, the co-founder and COO of the Miriam Institute. So a little bit about the format, we'll be starting with the Six Day War and we'll be basing that conversation on the opinion piece that was released in today's Washington Examiner by Brigadier General Reserves Abishai Levy. Let me tell you a little bit about Brigadier General Levy. He served for 30 years in the Israel Air Force, a career that culminated as the head of intelligence and reconnaissance in the Israel Air Force from 2007 to 2010. It was during his tenure that the Israeli Air Force successfully detonated the Syrian nuclear reactor. Prior to that, General Levy served as base commander at Ramon Air Force Base, during which time he oversaw the integration of the F-16I Advanced Aircraft Squadrons and the Apache Longbow Helicopter. He was also the head of the operations department for the Israel Air Force, and as someone who commanded two F-16 squadrons, he accrued extensive personal participation in major operations. He holds an executive MBA from the Tel Aviv University Reconati School of Management, a BA in general studies from Auburn University, Alabama, and is a graduate of the Advanced Command and Staff Course Leadership in Warfare Program of the US Air Force Air University. I also want to ask Alan, there is a, num there is a, a, a video that's showing that ought not to be sharing on this webinar. Alan, can you please jump in and close that video? Thank you very much. So General Levy wrote this paper. He's going to start off, as I said, and thereafter we will pivot to D-Day and we will hear from Colonel Richard Kemp. Colonel Richard Kemp, whose bio I'm not going to read in its entirety, has spent most of his life fighting terrorism and insurgency, commanding British troops on the front line at some of the world's toughest hotspots, including Afghanistan, Iraq, the Balkans, and Northern Ireland. He's now a writer, a prolific journalist, media commentator, and lecturer, and he provides strategic consultancy services on leadership, security, intelligence, counterterrorism, and defense. Richard was sent to Kabul in 2003 to take command of British forces in Afghanistan, Realizing that there was an increasing terrorist threat, but no resources or plans in place to deal with it, he immediately put together an unconventional force of British troops and US Marines. Those troops begged, borrowed and stole equipment to gain intelligence and to launch covert surveillance. Richard joined the British Army the day after he left school and spent the next 30 years in some of the world's most notorious trouble spots. And I'm very proud to have you here on this call as well. Colonel Richard Kemp, and bringing, rounding out our list of panelists is Colonel Liam Collins. Colonel Liam Collins, a retired officer of the United States Army, is now the executive director of the Viola Foundation and the Madison Policy Forum and a permanent member with the Council on Foreign Relations. He's a retired Special Forces Colonel. Liam served in a variety of special operations, assignments, and conducted operational deployments to Afghanistan, Iraq, Bosnia, the Horn of Africa, and South America. He's a defense and security expert, and he's written numerous articles, reports, and chapters for anthologies focused on terrorism and counterterrorism, insurgency and counterinsurgency, modern war, special operations, organizational innovation, and leadership. His work has been cited by the Assistant to the President for Homeland Security and Counterterrorism, by the White House Press Secretary, the New York Times, the Associated Press, CNN, ABC News, Fox News, NPR, the Wall Street Journal, and USA Today. Colonel Collins earned a BS in Mechanical Engineering Aerospace from the United States Military Academy and a Master in Public Affairs and PhD from the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University. Now, 
Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to begin with one question, which is to seek the approval of all three of our panelists to refer to them on this occasion by their first names. May I do so? Is that okay? When I've got a thumbs up from Liam. Avishai says yes. Now, Colonel Kemp, do I have your permission? On this one occasion only. There you go. I thought, <laughs> I thought you might say that. So, so let's roll directly to Avishai. Avishai, you penned this incredible piece that is featured as an op-ed, as I said, in the Washington Examiner, in today's Washington Examiner. And it comes from your perspective as an airman, as a, as a pilot, and as a senior commander in the Israel Air Force. And it talks about the Six Day War, which though launched on the 6th of June, we're obviously very much in the midst of commemorating and remembering and, and even celebrating. And you started off by saying that the Six Day War presents an exceptional case study of the Israeli Air Force's ethos of military planning and preparation, something that resulted from the clear understanding that the country's very existence rested in no small part upon the shoulders of its pilots, air crew, and ground crews. Our young nation felt like it was on the edge of the abyss. Describe for us, if you would, Avishai, the abyss that the state of Israel felt it was on the edge of prior to the Six Day War. Well, uh, hello, everybody. First, I want to thank everyone uh, for joining us. Thank you, uh, Benjamin and Rosita. Thank you, my uh, guys here, uh, Colin and uh, Kemp and Collins. Uh, let's start with talking about Israel, okay? Less than 20 years from independence, at 1948, two major war, the War of Independence and the Sinai Operation. Uh, and it's a young country uh, uh, bringing people from all around the world after World War II and the Holocaust, trying to establish and build a country, a Jewish country, the only Jewish country in the Middle East. From the day of independence until the Six Day War, the 67, uh, a, a major threat from all our countries around us, uh, either Egypt, Jordan, Syria, of course, Lebanon, and all the countries around Israel. Uh, the only way out is through the Mediterranean Sea, and other than that, cover by uh, a threat, very major threat. So, talking about a young country, uh, fighting in economy situation, a very terrible uh, economy situation, uh, no natural reserve, no natural nothing except of the people here trying to survive after two major war. And here we are, uh, just period to the Six Day War, uh, hearing every day a threat from the leaders of Egypt and Syria, and the threat is very direct. We're going to destroy Israel, uh, throw everyone to the sea, and destroy the Jewish state. We're talking about a couple of months before the war, uh, with some uh, uh, military moves uh, from uh, mostly from the, the Egyptian armies and the Egyptian leaders, Nasser, and the threat is real. Uh, I might say that in Tel Aviv, uh, they have like 20,000 graves waiting for uh, people uh, in case of war, because the threat was so real uh, that people was preparing uh, for the worst. Okay, so here we are after two wars, uh, trying to walk on our two young legs, and it's the biggest threat for the young country. This is the situation, it's hard to explain. Uh, I read a lot about that, and it's hard to understand uh, how deep was the threat in, in, and the fear in the uh, people and the heart of the civilian in Israel. And so, so as you said, it, it came to the point where 20,000 graves are yeah. dug for the eventuality of killed civilians and citizens within the state of Israel. And the Air Force is charged with this monumental responsibility for prioritizing the targets that needed to be dealt with or the adversary, adversaries and enemies that needed to be dealt with. And in particular, it, they needed to be able to deal with the mighty or the seemingly mighty Egyptian Air Force. How had the Air Force proven itself between the establishment of the state and the Six Day War ready 
and prepared to deal with those sorts of threats. And also, you wrote in your piece that the Israeli Air Force was massively, massively outnumbered in the context of others on our borders and beyond our borders, quite frankly. What was the ratio of Israeli fighters and fighter jets or, or fighter right. aircraft to, to the enemy? Yeah, well, just for your last question, the, the ratio was uh, less than 200 airplanes for the Israeli Air Force. Uh, I'll say against like something like 700 all around. Okay, so it's a ratio. It's a, it's a terrible ratio for, for, for the defenders or for the, the Israeli Air Force. But uh, nevertheless, I, I must say that uh, from the day of independence, the government in Israel, the leaders in Israel, believe in their uh, we were we were born and and educated uh, based on the British Air Force. Okay, uh, the Israeli Air Force was built on the on the legend of the British Air Force, and we grow through that from the day of independence to the first war until the Six Day War. So so although we were young and although there was uh, the ratio is bad, the country put a lot of effort in the Israeli Air Force buying airplane and more than that uh, prioritized the air crew in the israeli air force actually the air force was the first to choose each and every young guys at the age of 18 that he he asked for everyone who graduated high school the air force was the first to choose him if he wanted so uh in the positive way israel put the air force uh in a very high priority okay Doing that uh, and, and all the tactics and the strategy in the Air Force, we in the Air Force, we the Israeli Air Force, knew that there's a lot of responsibility on our shoulders. Uh, a young country, uh, a long borders, very long borders, and a lot of enemies and a lack of ground forces. So the first wave that we have to uh, stop uh, was by the Air Force. And if we need to do some strategic attack in either way, in either uh, theater, the Egyptian, the Southern theater, or this, the Northern one, it has to be the Air Force, it has to be the flexibility of the Air Force. So understanding that, and of course covered by the understanding of the serious situation that we've been, the Air Force built itself for this specific uh, occasion. And uh, the training, of course, and uh, uh, the planning and the intelligence were all focused for the big threat. And the big threat from our perspective, the first big threat or the first strategic threat was an attack by the strategic bomber, mostly of the Egyptian and the Syrian, on our cities. So uh, you might say that the first mission needed to stop those bombers to arrive to Israel. And it has to be very uh, quick. And it's much tougher to do that if you are on a defense, you're waiting for the attack. And in a minute, we'll talk about the preemptive uh, attack that we uh, launch, because this is the way uh, to reach and, and, and exceed and succeed in holding this bomber to attack Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, and all the other cities. So. The, the attack on the Egyptian Air Force, if I can focus on that, was not an attack that followed conservative military doctrine by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, it, it flew in the face of, of military doctrine in some ways. And it also was very much engaged and very much required the exploitation of day-to-day -day events in Cairo in order to be effective and also the deception, deception in, in, in the military sense uh, when it came to communications and so forth. So before I bring in Colonel Collins and Colonel Kemp, I, I want to ask you two, two questions about that and then one about the leadership of the State of Israel at the time. The State of Israel makes a decision according to your article to prioritize Egypt and to incapacitate, not to engage in dogfights with the Egyptian Air Force, but to incapacitate the Egyptian air capabilities while they are still on the runway. Now, in order to do that, you go to great pains to explain that the waves of attack needed to be extremely successful. Yeah. And, and that meant 
actually leaving almost nothing for defensive capabilities. Now, I want to contextualize this for the listeners. You were involved in the planning and the execution of the detonation of the Syrian reactor in 2007 in, in the Israeli Air Force. And, and I've watched and I've read about that. And one of the things that comes out of the senior ranks of the Air Force is the idea that they knew that once they had hit the Syrian nuclear facility, the biggest problem was dealing with a retaliatory strike, that they could have a war breakout immediately afterwards and they had to weigh the pros and cons of that, and therefore they had to be in a state of readiness for that. Now, in the Six-Day War, you didn't have the aircraft that would allow you to at once launch an attack and, and be ready for defensive measures. How much of its aircraft did Israel throw at that first wave of, of bombings? What did it leave for defensive purposes? Let's start with that question. Well, let's start with saying that uh, we had uh, the understanding that we have only one chance. It has to be a preemptive attack, not waiting for the, the waves of bomber arriving to Tel Aviv. It will be much tougher. So the generals try to uh, influence the government and the leaders of Israel to start with the preemptive attack, which uh, it's uh, uh, succeed in the end. Uh, in military perspective, we had only one chance, a, a chance of a day or two, because uh, if we succeed in that, we stop the bomber on the ground, on the runway, who's hitting the runway themselves, okay? And it will take some time to uh, uh, build it again. And we can arrange ourselves, and we can destroy airplane on the ground by hitting them, by bombs and, and strafe. We may succeed. For after, when, when you understand that, and you understand that you have only one chance, you have to plan very carefully. You have to bring all the intelligence, both military and civilian, and leadership intelligence, into the planning. You have to know exactly where and every and each airplane is waiting in the runway, on the runway, and the shelters. And you have to plan that in the deception of uh, trying to surprise your enemy. So yeah, for your question uh, and, and the lack of numbers of the Israeli uh, airplanes and a lot of target that you have to hit and you want to hit in the first and the second wave. Okay, it's not one wave, it's three waves of attack. Uh, started with Egypt and Syria, but mostly Egypt and then Syria. You have to plan it very carefully. So uh, the decision that the military leaders took, the Air Force leaders took, is to leave nothing on the defense, bring almost every airplane, just few, few, few airplanes. Uh, use a deception in, in the radio calls, use some, uh, the, Air, uh, the Air Force Academy airplane just to uh, act like a normal training day. Uh, but more than that, just to bring every airplane that can carry bombs into the war, uh, give each and every one of them a target, plan that very carefully, and launch, launch them, uh, all of them together, train them very carefully, and just bring all the knowledge, all the training, all the planning, all the intelligence for uh, 7.45 in the morning, the time of the rush hour in Cairo, the time that we know that the generals are in their way from home to the office. There was no cell phone at that time. Uh, the time that the, the morning uh, air patrol just landed and refueling and were waiting for them to, to re-take uh, off. Uh, yes, don't deal with the airplane in the air because we wanted to bring as much bomb as we can to the runway. So bring everything together to a very tied planning uh, was the way that the Israeli Air Force planners uh, thought it might succeed. So I, I want to internationalize this a little bit before I come back to you to talk about Cairo, Avishai. And I want to bring in Colonel Colin or Liam, as you've given me the permission to call you, and, and Richard. I want you, please, to... to Paint for us, if you would, we've heard what Avishai said Israel viewed itself as in terms of the dangers facing it. 
Today, Israel is perceived as being a, a military powerhouse, certainly in the region, if not globally. That wasn't the case in 67. In 67, Israel's main ally was France, and there was very much an attitude of whether or not this country would survive, whether it was worthy of investment or not, on the parts of many in the international community. So let's start with Liam. Liam, what was the United States' attitude to this plucky little country, as Avishai said, on its two young legs, having to go out and defend itself because there was a diplomatic tour undertaken by Abba Eba, our former ambassador, pleading for help and assistance, and no help really was forthcoming. In fact, I, I remember a quote from Lyndon Johnson at the time, sort of very politely explaining that he wished Israel all the best of luck, but he didn't seem too optimistic about its chances. Liam, if you'd go with that first, and then I'll come to you, Richard, for, for Britain's perspective. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you look at the last 20 or 30 years, you know, the U.S. has been you know, all over the world. But part of that, right, it's, it's, it was really more of an isolation tendency by the U.S. going back to World War I, World War II. And, and you have to look and understand how geography plays into this, right, and, and plays into national security strategies. So for the U.S., we have two large oceans. And so we have the luxury of being isolationists and let things kind of play out, at least, you know, prior to, you know, it, the world shrinking as it is now. Uh, Israel, Israel didn't have that luxury, right? What we say is they have no strategic depth, right? Israel is such a small nation, they couldn't trade space for time, right? So therefore, any war has to be really preemptive because it's, it's just too small. If they give up 10 miles, right, you're already in the heart of Israel. And so this plays into their strategy, right? They have to have a very good intelligence system, right? I have the aircraft so they can attack, uh, you know, the the enemy aircraft on the ground. And, and so you can kind of look at that attack, um, you know, from a couple, right? Is it, is it calculated risk or a military gamble? I don't want to get into that. But kind of the question you were asking, is it, was it a risky operation? And too often we, we say, was it risky uh, for anything that we evaluate? And I think often we, we, we kind of don't understand what we mean by risk, right? Anything, any military operation is inherently risky and brings up the concept of risk, risk aversion. But what I think people fail to consider is the idea of the time horizon. Oftentimes something we say a commander is risk averse, which we're really what we mean is in the short term, they're risk averse, averse, but in the long term, they're actually risk seeking. And I'll explain it kind of here. So in this case, right, the Air Force attack, really it was a short term risk, right? They were risk seeking in the short term, right? They were going to throw everything at taking out uh, the aircraft on the ground and really leave themselves no reserve. Right? And so we think if, if you have no reserve, that's very risky. Uh, but at the same time, in the long term, it's actually, it, it, it's not risky because if they can take out the aircraft as opposed to holding some back, and then they're constantly engaging in, you know, an air war or these, you know, Egyptian or Syrian aircraft can then, uh, right, attack the Israeli forces on the ground. So, it, right, in, I think in the short term, it was a risky operation, but in the long term, it was actually uh, right, it wasn't risky uh, in, in that perspective because they could take them out. And and Colonel Kemp, what what was the perception of Britain to the state of Israel? Again, this fledgling country at the time, how did they think that the state of Israel was going to see its way through these challenges? Well, as you know, Britain has a a sort of checkered record with Israel. Um, by the time of the sixty seven war. We were on very good terms with Israel and we were going through a period, a relatively limited period of cooperation um, between Britain and the state of Israel. And um, back 11 years beforehand, Britain, France and Israel had um, coordinated and cooperated in an effort to deal with the Egyptian problem created at the Suez Canal. Uh, and since then, Britain and Israel had been uh, working relatively closely together militarily and Britain had been providing arms and weapons to Israel. Um, and, and Britain, I think, very much at that time saw itself on Israel's side at the time of the 67 war. Um, it did see Israel as being a, a useful ally to have in the Middle East. It saw Israel as being, um, a, you know, a, a, a stabilizing force in the Middle East. But at the same time, it also recognized the dangers that its interests, Britain's interests, faced um, by being seen to side with Israel against the Arabs. And um, I, I think that, you know, the 67 war obviously made a lot of people sit up, including Britain. Um, 
and 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 have a great deal more respect for Israel than than many countries had had before. I would say that the the consequence of the sixty seven war for the UK um, or for UK Israel relations was to to distance the UK from Israel, um, which is a slightly sort of counterintuitive perspective, but I think that's what happened, and it happened because. Um, in the immediate aftermath of the Six Day War, Israel, Arab countries, particularly Egypt, uh, uh, started to punish Britain for its support for Israel during the war by imposing, um, uh, I'm not sanctions as a wrong word, by imposing um, limitations on sale of oil, etc., and other other forms of um, of retribution against Britain. And Britain clearly. Uh, felt it was uh, a danger to its interest by having that. And so Britain effectively, from that time onwards, turned against Israel. Already there'd been a strong anti-Israeli perspective among some in the Foreign Office, going right the way back to the, uh, back to the First World War, really. Um, but, but it was after the 67 War, really, that that was reinforced. And I think it's something that we've seen played out in British-Israeli relations right up to today. Although I think Britain-Israel have very close relations now, um, and particularly on the military and intelligence and security side. But, but the, the, the effects of the Arab reaction to Britain's support for Israel uh, after the 67 war, I think, are still felt in, in the hallowed halls, for want of a better word, of Whitehall. So, Avishai, I want to come back to you now. And, and with, with Liam and Richard having said a little bit about how the world perceived Israel at this stage. In this high stakes game, Israel goes all in. You've spoken about the need to hit the Egyptians while on the runway, you've spoken about the decision to leave next to nothing for defensive purposes. I want to ask you just a couple of other questions about this. Uh, the first one is, there's this amazing radio silence that is pervasive throughout the attack and there's also the exploitation and people again can read about this in your article which is on our website the miriam institute website there's this incredible exploitation of the traffic situation the rush hour traffic situation in cairo when it came to identifying the optimal moment of the strike so you have these this radio silence decoy communications coming from the state of Israel for the Egyptians to hear and to be deceived by. And then you have this, this strike during rush hour. Just talk us through, through that, please. And then I'll ask you one, one last question about the Six Day War with regard to leadership. Well, when you plan a deception, uh, you need to think about some levels. You cannot uh, build your deception only on one level. Uh, first, because normally, uh, the, the enemy is watching you in more than one way, okay? And secondly, if they catch your deception, if it's only one level, you are done. So when you, when you look at deception and planning, you need to take uh, in consider and to cover as much as you can of the normal day or what you want to, to hide. So yeah, taking uh, and planning when to attack was built on military understanding and intelligence. This is exactly the time that the morning uh, patrol, the air patrol in the morning are landing just around 7.30 in the morning. And it will take them around 45 to 50 minutes to refuel and be ready uh, for, for jump up if something, uh, if something happened. But this is from the military or the Air Force uh, perspective, okay? Uh, from, uh, from intelligence, the military intelligence the Egyptian military intelligence, they both build on, at that time, on radio, uh, listening to the radio, the military uh, channels, and the radars. So you have to uh, cover both of them. But yeah, radio deceptions and radar picture. So in that way, the, the Israeli uh, Air Force Academy airplane were flying in the training area of the fighter training area, normally flying, and they are using the radio science call or call signs of the fighters training because they knew that the guys that listen in Egypt know the numbers, know the areas, know the call signs, and he will look for that. At the same time, when we talk about uh, planning, you, you need to take in consideration not only military. 
And yeah, normally we in the Air Force, uh, uh, the Israeli Air Force, okay, I don't know about the, the, my, my friends here, we will attack either in 7, 7.30 or 8. Nothing in between, okay? But 7.45 is something that we don't normally do that, okay, for, for, for 70 years. Uh, but 7.45 was uh, taking into consideration both the Air Patrol and the normal uh, routine of the uh, Egyptian intelligence. And yes, the time that we know, we knew then that the generals, the Air Force generals, the Egyptian Air Force generals, and the chief of staff will be in their office at around 8. So 7.45, after covering that in Cairo, the rush hour in Cairo, with no cell phone and nothing, will help us to find if something happened, the chief of staff in his car, in his way to his office. So you need to cover as many layers of deception that you, uh, that you can if you want to succeed that. Don't build on only on one way, on one channel, try to cover that. So it's both uh, leadership and military high level leadership and tactics and intelligence and readiness of your enemy. And this is what we try to do as much as we could at that time, okay? So my last question for you, Avishai, before I do a round robin and ask you all to assess the Six Day War and its, its success. I, I, I want to ask about leadership, which is what you mentioned. There's this incredible story of many politicians, many within even the general staff of the states of Israel who see the enemies of Israel rounding on its borders and again beyond its borders. And the prime minister at the time is Levi Eshkol. Right. And prior to Levi Eshkol, you had, of course, David Ben-Gurion. And they traveled down, some of these individuals who were worried about Eshkol's ability to handle the war. They actually tried to bring Ben-Gurion out of retirement to, to serve alongside or even replace Eshkol. What was the character of leadership? Ben-Gurion ultimately refused to do that. Right. But what was the character of leadership that enabled this bespectacled engineer, Levi Eshkol, this, this prime minister, not the most charismatic of Israel's leaders and so forth, what enabled him and what enabled the, the, chiefs of staff, the chief of staff and also the senior brass of the Israel Defense Forces writ large to see the threat in front of them, to face it down and to determine that they were going to overcome it, despite the voices of panic that definitely were emanating from very, very close proximity indeed. Well, first, uh, yeah, uh, we need to talk about the prime minister, okay? We, the military people, we are looking through our military perspective. Of course, the prime minister have much more than just the military perspective to deal with. Uh, just for example, uh, a coalition, a relationship with some, some countries, okay, like we mentioned before. Uh, the day after, what do you want to achieve? What's your end state solution after the war? So the prime minister had to deal with much more than just what is right militarily to do, okay? So, but the, the, the gap between the leadership, the civilian leadership, Mr. Levi Eshkol as the prime minister and his government, and the understanding of the general chief of staff and his generals, the gap was very, very big, okay? As much as the prime minister uh, hesitated, I don't know if he would change his mind if things were different, but he hesitated at that time if to allow the military to have a preemptive attack. At that time, the generals understood or believed that without a preemptive attack, there is no chance for the country. They really believe in that. And there are some unique times in history of country that it's, uh, it's the right time to, to say that. Okay, it's very dangerous. It's very sensitive. Uh, the military has to do as the government told him, told him uh, and, and, and command him. But at that time, the understanding in the military was that there is no two answers. It's not about how many casualties, it's about the surviving of the country. And if without any dramatic change of movement in the military, 
speaking about preemptive attack, the chances are very much against Israel, very much against Israel. We'll see that a couple of years after that in the 73 war, okay, the same situation and the prime minister said no. Okay, the same situation, the prime minister, Mrs. Mrs. Golda Meir said no. Uh, but at that time, yeah, with the hesitation of the prime minister and uh, the, the opinion of the gov on the government and the, the shadow of Mr. David Ben-Gurion, the, the, the leader of Israel for so many years, that just retired, uh, the general said, we need to do that. There is no other way. Tell you that this is, was the right way to do yes or no. Uh, you know, the answer in, in result is yes, but is it the right way to go? It's a big question. <laughs> Thank you, Avisha. I'm going to now move to, to Richard and to Liam, because you, you, you so clearly and vividly explained how Israel was as this young country now forced to defend itself. So the perception was very unsure prior to the war, but the perception of Israel after the war was very, very different. So Liam, what did the victory of the Six Day War mean to the international community, particularly to the United States? And also as, as, as a colonel in the United States military, how do you assess the Six Day War in terms of military doctrine and practice and, and strategy and so forth? Yeah, uh, yeah thanks, Benjamin. I, mean, I guess given kind of the, the time we're trying to cover two topics, I'll focus more on kind of the, the military kind of lessons le learned from it rather than the political. And really, the U.S. was really surprised and shocked by the success of the Israelis in the war and really their dominating victory. And so really, we went over there, studied from it, learned from it, and it's really kind of the seminal conflict that shapes the way our, our military fought for the next 20, 30 years and how we organized. So we looked at a couple of things, right? So one is the exchange ratio. Think of that as a tank on tank battle. What is the trade-off independent of the aircraft, Air Force bombing? What was that exchange ratio? And it favored the Israels by a ratio of three to five to one. So every one tank the Israelis lost, they were taking out three to five Egyptian or Syrian tanks, right? A extremely high level, right? And that's a function of technology partially, but we really looked at it as a function of the training and the doctrine and leadership that they had. And so we came out from there and developed what we called airland battle, which, right, it was how can we defeat a, a superior, a, a Russian force that's superior in numbers, with a smaller number, just like the Israelis won in, in the Six Day War, how could we defeat a superior Russian invasion in, in uh, East, East, Western Europe? And so, right, combination of using that the aircraft, right, to support the ground forces, uh, and, and then really kind of re revamping the doctrine. Uh, and so, we created our national training center, like I said, the Airland Battle Doctrine, and then really we saw this play out to success in the 1991 Gulf War just like the Six Days War, where the Israelis expected a significantly more casualties, so did we in the Gulf War expected a much, much higher casualty rate. Uh, but because we had implemented the doctrine so effectively and because the, the Saudis did not even follow some of their own doctrine and, and tactics and training in a lot of cases, allowed us to really dominate, the, dominate that in a way that was completely unexpected or really unseen in any war previously, right? In terms of the the complete domination there, but it really all stemmed from what we learned from looking at the Six Days War, studying that and changing our doctrine. So, can, uh, Richard Kemp, you already spoke about the, the ramifications for Britain about this. I now want to pivot to D-Day, because as I, as I spoke about with my great and powerful colleague, Alan, just prior to this call, it's highly likely that had D-Day not occurred, or there's every possibility that had D-Day not occurred and had it not led to the, ultimately the success of the Allied powers, that perhaps I and Avishai and others of the Jewish faith uh, may not even be on this phone call today. I mean, there was so much that hung in the balance around D-Day. Can you please just put us into what was at play? What was this incredible operation, Operation Overlord, launched in the pursuit of, and, and what did really hang in the balance for the free world at that time? Very small question you asked there. Um, yep. I think, I mean, quite obviously, 
um, you know, the United Kingdom had been fighting against the Germans since 1939 um, on various different fronts around the world, including in Europe, um, using air power and also using the Special Operations Executive, which mobilized uh, resistance to Germans in, in, uh, across Europe, across the whole of Europe, uh, as well as fighting in Norway, fighting in North Africa and various other theaters of war. Um, so it was, it was effectively a continuation of, of that war that we'd been fighting. It was only made possible, the, the invasion of Europe was only made possible by the entry, of course, of the United States into the Second World War, because Britain on its own didn't really have the, the military power to, to launch an invasion of that magnitude and couldn't have done it. Indeed, it took two years after the United States entered to build up um, the, the, the combat power to, to do so. Um, but it was it was clearly a vital thing to do, although it wasn't seen by everybody as being the, the logical next step to take. And indeed, Winston Churchill and Alan Brooke, the British, um, uh, the head of the British Armed Forces, the uh, chief of the Imperial General Staff at the time, both of those and others, of course, felt that it was still too early to invade Europe head on, as, as occurred on D-Day. And there should be other operations taking place to to carry out greater attrition against the Third Reich um, before we did that. And Roosevelt and others opposed um, those, uh, those alternatives and wanted a, an invasion of Europe in 1944. Uh, and the other people, of course, who wanted an invasion of Europe in 1944 were the Russians, who bore an incredible brunt of the Second World War, more than most people give them account could give them credit for in some respects, even though they started off on the side of the Nazis in, in reality, and between the Nazis and themselves, they divided up Poland, but they had been fighting extremely hard and, and they had been desperate uh, with their offensive from the East. They'd been desperate for the allies to, to, to launch an attack on, on Germany. So it was, it was really necessary for that to happen in order for the Russian steamroller coming in from the East to succeed. Now, it may be, and I think, you know, historians are divided on this issue, but it may be that had, um, had, this, had the Western invasion not happened, then um, uh, the Russians still could have conquered the Germans, possibly. We don't know. We will, we will never know that. But if they had, of course, then um, that raises the question as to what would have happened to the rest of Western Europe. And it's every likelihood if the Russians had had the, had the strength to do so, they'd have certainly rolled straight across into the rest of Europe. And, and not just the Jewish people, but uh, us non-Jews as well might uh, not be here today to tell the tale. Um, so it was an extremely important fight that was being put up. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, ultimately, it was proved right. And, and the offensive on D-Day in 1944, the greatest amphibious invasion in the history of the world, either before or since, was a phenomenal success. It wasn't without its problems and it didn't lead to an immediate lightning campaign against the Germans heading towards Berlin as, as had been planned and hoped for, but then very few military operations do go according to plan. Uh, but I think that's, you know, that was the stakes that were being faced. It was, it was either to, uh, to, to, to have uh, victorious Germany or victorious Soviet Russia. And, and Leon, tell us on the same point, if you would, tell us a bit about what America viewed as central to its goals on D-Day and, and the, the sheer scale of the operation launched, if you would. Yeah, I mean, right, and, and keep in mind, right, we sat out the first two years of the war, you know, again, in that isolationist tradition, which is easy again by the, by the, by the oceans that we had there. And really it was, you know, uh, Japan pulled off, you know, a, a, ta a tactical, you know, success, you know, amazing attack on Pearl Harbor. But at the same time, politically, it was somewhat idiotic because it forced the U.S. to come in probably earlier than it would have otherwise and really united the public. Uh, so, yeah, you, you know, uh, by D-Day, um, right, we're fully committed, you know, even after, right after Pearl Harbor, we're committed to it. Um, but we're committed to the conflict there. But just in, in terms of the scale, right, uh, you know, I don't think, you know, I'll kind of paint some of the pictures, but I don't think like even Saving Private Ryan can kind of do it justice. Uh, and so you think, right, the Atlantic Wall, what the Germans had to defend was 2,400 miles of fortifications, bunkers, landmines, beach obstacles of the coast. Um, but really, less than 20% of the world's coastline is actually considered suitable for, 
amphibious assault. So really they didn't have to defend 2,400 miles. You're talking about 500 miles kind of of amphibious assault, right? So they can focus their effort. And then you think about, okay, what's actually the distance, be, right? You wanna minimize the distance that you're transporting troops, right? Because they're vulnerable on the open sea um, or it just tips off your hand if you're doing a, a large movement. So really once you narrow it down to the kind of the, the distance on the channel, it's a much reduced coastline of the potential areas of likely attack. Uh, and so the Germans could really focus their effort there. Um, it it kind of, you, you know, I was there 15 years ago on the Normandy beaches at the same time of the attack, a month earlier, but the same time of day when the, 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 the um, tides would be the same. And, and I was standing on the edge of the coastline and sprinted to the bunker and it took me a minute, right? So it's about a quarter mile, 400 meters, depending on what system of, distance you use. And it right, and that was with no equipment, not getting shot at, no obstacles. And I was starting from the coast, right? I wasn't starting in the water, neck deep water. Uh, so you know, how did they get to that coast through there to the bunkers, right? Is is truly amazing. I'll pause there. So the the thing about this is you you you've got this 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 commemoration of D-Day on, on June 6th. But actually, it was supposed to launch on June fifth, and 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 what prevented it from from doing so was good old fashioned British weather, and and that prevention and, and that preventative, if you like, really challenged another aspect of the D-Day launch, which Avishai made mention of in the context of the Six Day War, namely the deception uh, and the intelligence and counterintelligence that was employed by the Allied forces in order to move the Germans attention away from defending those areas that you just Liam spoke about. Can, can you talk to us a little bit about those efforts that were made? Um, ideas that there was going to be, for example, a force launched directly from the United States to the Western coast of France. An idea, uh, Colonel Kemp, Richard, if you would come in on this, that the British were going to launch forces, in fact, from, from Scotland uh, into Norway. Uh, tell us a little bit about the deception process that Pre, that, that all good in the operation uh, on D-Day. Uh, and I'll take that to, to you, Liam, first, if you would, please. Yeah, and, and so I think during World War II, actually, the, the Allies did very well with deception. I think that's an art we've kind of forgotten over time. Uh, but right, a extreme focus on there. In fact, they had, a, it was called Operation Fortitude. It was the name of the deception operation to deceive the Nazis of the location of the actual invasion. And the purpose of it, right, was to confuse them where the invasion would happen, direct their attention away from Normandy, first of all. And the second part was, even after the landings occurred there, was to convince them that that was a diversionary attack, right? To be successful of an amphibious assault, you kind of need, as, as, as defense analyst Michael Hanwell argued, right, you need to have air superiority, really local air superiority at that assault site, initial troop advantage at that point of attack, but then even after that, right, you have to secure the lodgement and, and the buildup at the point of attack, right? So to see them, even after we've launched 156,000 soldiers on the beach or in the vicinity of the beach, that this is just a diversionary attack and convince them of that. And on, on all accounts, we were successful in that, right? Through a combination of physical deceptions, right? Large, right, dummy fleets and, you know, of ships, dummy tanks uh, to deceive, right, uh, their intelligence apparatus. Um, fake wireless activity to make it sound like we're actually staging elsewhere or the attacks coming from elsewhere, uh, to include actual bombing, right, of the radar sites. For every one radar site that they bombed in the Normandy Beach area, they bombed two others outside of the Normandy Beach area to really convince them, right, and then controlled leaks, right, providing misinformation to double agents or, right, or underground and auxiliaries that were within Germany of where that would attack would actually take place. So really a commitment to that deception that allowed it to be successful in Normandy. And, and Richard, tell us about the weather. And, and Avishai, I want to bring you in in just a moment on, on the matter of the Air Force. But before I do, Richard, tell us about what I mentioned with regard to the weather and the protection methods. Well, I mean, uh, General Levy mentioned a few times in his uh, talk the subject of intelligence. And intelligence in all of these wars and every war that's ever been fought and will ever be fought is absolutely critical, possibly in some respects, the most fundamental aspect. Um, and 
the G German intelligence in the Second World War was notoriously weak um, compared certainly to Allied intelligence. And that showed up on this occasion because uh, as uh, Colonel Collins has, has made clear, um, the Germans got it wrong. They, they, they went for our deception operation and that was a failure of intelligence. Um, of course, you know, we put a lot of effort in, a huge amount of effort into deceiving their intelligence and it worked. Um, and, and that, um, I think, was probably beyond most other factors, the, the single most thing that led to uh, our victory on D-Day. Um, the, the, and it, wasn't, it, it was highly sophisticated and actually com comparable in many ways with Israeli intelligence and deception in, uh, in the uh, Six-Day War. And, you know, the Israelis very famously had um, an Egyptian, for example, an Egyptian uh, agent who was working in Israel and who was turned to work for Israel against the Egyptians who gave them false information and misled them as to what the Israelis were planning. We also had a number of agents um, that we turned as well, German agents, that we turned and fed them disinformation, which played very, very strongly into, into that. Um, and, you know, I think you, could, you can make many other comparisons between, um, you know, Br British intelligence or allied intelligence in, uh, in the D-Day operation and Israeli intelligence in the Sixth Seven War, including, um, you know, agents in, in the heart of the enemy. And there was a, a, a famous Israeli agent called Wolfgang Lotz, who had been in Cairo for several years before the invasion who, uh, before the uh, Six Day War, who provided a lot of very, very valuable intelligence. We equally had agents within the German system and in France in particular, providing intelligence to us. And so it was, you know, use of intelligence and counterintelligence was critical. Um, and, and one other aspect of intelligence you mentioned is weather. Um, we had the right weather intelligence. On the 5th of June, uh, Air Marshal Stag or Air Com, Air Captain Stagg, I think he was, a, um, an Air Force weather uh, expert, told Eisenhower there would be a break in the weather on the 6th of June, which would be adequate to launch an invasion. The Germans did not have that same weather assessment, and therefore they were all sort of not expecting an invasion at that time. But just to, just to emphasize how critical this was and, and how it seems to us now watching Saving Private Ryan, etc. It seems to us now how much of a certainty the success of this operation was. But let me just read a very brief um, statement written by General Eisenhower. He wrote it on the 5th of June, um, expecting, having made the decision after hearing the weather assessment that we would go ahead on the 6th of June. Um, and he made this statement, which said, our landings in the Sherbrooke Harbour area have failed to gain a satisfactory foothold and I have withdrawn the troops. My decision to attack at this time and place was based upon the best information available. The troops, the air and the Navy did all that bravery and devotion to duty could do. If any blame or fault attached to the attempt, it is mine alone. Which not only says something about the, the concerns he had of the likelihood of success of this operation, he had to prepare a statement in case it failed, but it also shows his strength of leadership in shouldering the complete blame had failure occurred. Yeah, it's an incredible quote, and I actually prepared that quote here as well. I, I was so struck by that, and thank you for bringing that to us. I, I'd like to ask you, Avishai, before I turn back to Liam and, and Richard to talk about what happened once they managed to get to the beach, which, is, as we've heard, was by no means certain, can you, uh, can you assess the air forces of the Allied powers, including, obviously, Great Britain and, and the United States of America, and also the Luftwaffe, the Germans. What, what's Israel's attitude on the air capabilities of the, these three powers? I mean, one, one of the main reasons that Britain was there to participate in this and to, to, to take a central role in the D-Day landings was, of course, the great success of the pilots during the Battle of Britain. What, what's the air force in Israel's view of the air forces that were engaged in D-Day, in, in, in the Second World War, rather? Well, let, let me tell you that when I was a cadet in the Air Force Academy, I, I remember, as I remember today, that at the same week, I guess around June, we got a lot of lecture on the Six-Day War and D-Day, the same days, okay? Uh, yeah, bringing both 
operation, huge and, and, and successful operation together to us, our, the, the cadet, and uh, put us in a position that uh, in our early stage in the Air Force, we uh, needed and of course enjoyed, learn about Israel, a young country, okay, 20 years before, and the superpower and the world war. And yeah, there was a question, why do we need to uh, learn about D-Day? What it's come to us, how, how can we find? And there were two words, two special words like Richard said. One was intelligence, second was deception. Because the ratio is different, the strategy was different, uh, the, the, the armor forces totally different, and the war is different. But uh, from days of uh, uh, the early days of history, intelligence and deception may change the, the, the war. Okay, so we needed to learn about these days and uh, not about the ratio and not about the armed forces and not about the power, about intelligence, how you collect intelligence and what is your deception uh, uh, planning. Okay. And uh, there was some equivalent in between the Six Day War in, in our perspective, okay? In our Israeli Air Force perspective, between the Six Day War preparation uh, of intelligence deception and the D-Day. Talking about Air Forces, of course, we grow, as I said, about, uh, uh, we grow on the pilot of the Royal Air Force. We, the Israeli Air Force, were built of the legend and the tactics and the doctrines of the British Air Force. And if you, you grow on this legend and grow this uh, strategy, you uh, learn to admire the, the enthusiasm and the tactics and the wisdom, the powers and the pilot of the Royal Air Force. So I, I can talk another you know, day or two about the, the Royal Air Force, of course, but. Uh, since then, uh, I've been flying in, in, in Great Britain and in the United States for many times and, and trained with both Air Forces. And uh, I think, as Richard said, we have a very good intelligence and Air Force connection between this Israel and the Great Britain Air Force, and of course the US Air Force uh, uh, flying together here in the Middle East and in, in overseas for the Israeli Air Force. And as much as I said, it's great Air Forces, we learn a lot from both Air Forces and build our strategy on the knowledge and the lessons learned from each and every war that those two Air Forces, of course, uh, uh, covers and suffers and, and, and wants. So yeah, great, great respective and, and, and for the British Air Force and of course the US Air Force. So, so thank you, Liam. Tell us, there's this picture of this planning for D-Day and storming the beaches and so forth. And then there's another picture that emerges, which is a massive sacrifice, massive casualties, and tremendous, tremendous chaos on the part of the Allied forces. I'd like you to speak about that. And I also want you to, to define exactly, and this will seem like an odd question, but I, I think it bears being answered. What was the precise objective there? for the troops, assuming that they made it past the challenges, assuming that they regrouped with their units and with their brigades and with their commands, what were they specifically see seeking to bring about in, in, the, in the days after? Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some of kind of the, the challenges of the, of the you know, heroism or bravery or something. And, I, and, and, and you should appreciate this. I, I'm gonna also show that a, a little inner service rivalry is alive and well. Please do. Uh, yes. Um, you know, so one thing we've kind of been focusing on the beachhead, but we haven't talked about five hours prior to the, the landing invasion, we sent in, you know, 18,000 paratroopers. So 14,000 jumped in, as we call it, parachuted in, and another 4,000 on wooden gliders, right? Right. That were towed in and they just kind of glided into, into where they needed to land, right? So I'll talk that a little bit, being a former paratrooper, uh, you know, people would ask me, why do you jump out of a perfectly good airplane? Right. I, as, as Benjamin said in the introduction, I was an aerospace engineer, right? So I, I have full confidence in the airplane. It's the pilot that I question. And that's why I jump out of the airplane, right? But, <laughs> but, right? But, 
but to, right, I mean, any of the movies probably show it well, right? They're flying in there, right? They're getting shot the whole time. They're dropping paratroopers. They have no idea where they're, where they're landing, right? Many of them in the wrong drop zones. They don't have maps and they just kind of link up and, and start securing things, so, right? What is their objective? Right, any unit might have had their objective and didn't know. Uh, when I got to the 82nd as a young lieutenant, got there right before our kind of annual, um, you know, day when we have, a, you know, a formal function, and they bring up how our battalion commander of World War II had, you know, one of the shortest, uh, shortest operations ever. He jumped in on the D-Day invasion, landed in a German motor pool where they store their equipment, and was immediately captured. So his war was over immediately after jumping in. Um, or, or Private Bobby Jones, a, a British soldier who, who lied to join the military, joined at the age of 14, and he jumped into D-Day at the age of 16, so was the youngest soldier to jump into the invasion. Uh, or, right, another soldier that landed on the church, right, if you go to the church in the, in the town of St. Mary Glees, right, there's still a parachute up there on the church, where he landed on the steeple of the church, couldn't get down, and he just basically had to pretend he was asleep for two hours before the German canceled him. So imagine this fighting going on around you and you're hanging off the side of a steeple trying to play dead, right? Um, but right, in terms of what were their immediate objectives, right? Fundamentally, it was to secure the coast there that then they could bring, right, the other landing craft and start bringing in the heavy equipment, the tanks, all those kind of things. Like I, like I, I talked a little bit about before, right? Uh, right, achieve that local air superiority so those units on the ground have a chance, right? Initial troop advantage at the point of the attack, right? Just overwhelm them, right? Get through all these obstacles so you can get some of those bunker and take those bunkers out. And then that's only part of it, right? Uh, and then finally, right, we have to achieve a buildup at that point of attack so that then we can bring over, right, the tanks and the other forces that we can eventually make that push to Berlin. So even if they have been successful at establishing that beachhead, if the Germans could have counterattacked, pushed them off, pushed them off the beachhead, right? It wouldn't have been a successful amphibious invasion. So really, at, at any little level, right? It was to secure the town of Saint Mary Iglesias for some of those paratroopers uh, inland, uh, and for others, right? It was secure that secure the beach, and that's kind of fundamentally what it was to bring the troops across. Richard, can you supplement that as well, please, if you would, from the British perspective? Yeah, I mean, I. I... Um, first of all, I'd point out that behind me, I don't know if you can see it, but behind me on over my shoulder, there's a, a scene from uh, the Normandy beaches on D-Day. Um, one of the things you can see is a, a Sherman tank. And I chose that picture for this webinar specifically because that same tank, not the exact one there, but the Sherman tank was used both in on D-Day and also in the 96-7 war some years later. Oh, it had been upgunned and modified by then, but it was quite incredible to think that these same tanks were still in use over 20 years afterwards. Um, the uh, General Levy was good enough to, um, to praise both the US Air Force and the RAF. I would say one thing about that, which is that he's spoken about the uh, Israeli Air Force attacking at 7.45 in the morning. The RAF would never do that. It's far too early for the RAF to get up. You certainly wouldn't see them doing any airstrikes before at least midday, possibly mid-afternoon. And that's only a relatively short window before they retired their five-star hotels. Um, and Colonel Collins was good enough to, um, to, to comment on a young 16-year-old British paratrooper who jumped in on D-Day. And I'd like also to mention an American uh, soldier, Lieutenant Robert Halperin, who was the first man ashore on D-Day, first American ashore on D-Day. Lieutenant Halperin was a Jewish soldier um, in, the, uh, in the U.S. Navy Scouts and Raiders, which is essentially the predecessors of the U.S. Navy SEALs. And his job, he was commanding 14 scout boats whose job was to, to, to land before the, uh, the, the main invasion and mark out the landing beaches for the infantry to come in, to, to both to make sure they avoided um, being struck by, if, if possible, being struck by our own air power and artillery, uh, and naval artillery, but also um, to guide them into the right positions. And if you can imagine, we've all, I, I would imagine most of us have seen Saving Private Ryan, one of the most terrifying films I think is possible to watch about war. Um, but imagine being the first person in on those beaches, um, 
on that day. Uh, it's quite an incredible thing, uh, absolutely total undiluted heroism by this young Jewish lieutenant who won the Bronze Star that day. And uh, he, he saved a number of sailors or soldiers from drowning himself personally, um, took great risks to guide himself in uh, or to guide the troops in. Um, and he also won, uh, in addition to the Bronze Star he won that day, he won another Bronze Star elsewhere in the war, a Silver Star and the Navy Cross. So he was a very, very courageous man, fought in North Africa, uh, D-Day, and later in the uh, Japanese theater. So that, that was an example I wanted to mention. Um, and the, in terms of um, the, uh, the, the objectives and so on, and the, and the immediate uh, intentions, General Montgomery was commander, the British General Montgomery was commander of the land forces on this invasion for, for quite a long time afterwards, after the landing took place. And his immediate objective was to, to take the, the, the town of Conn, which was a strategically important town. Um, and, and I think most people um, at the time, including General Eisenhower, doubted um, the ability of this landing force to take Conn in the time that Montgomery intended. And indeed, it didn't prove possible. And it led that the, the probably the, the misjudgment in trying to take on so quickly led, I think, to an attritional fight that took place over many days. And it wasn't until the 11th of June, which was later than had been hoped for. It wasn't until the 11th of June that the, uh, the, the, the beaches, all of the beaches and the immediate area beyond them had been secured by the Allied forces. So it was a tough fight. The Americans came off by far the worst, and that was to a large extent because the, uh, the bombing raids that took place, a lot of the, the strategy or the tactics of this invasion were around bombing German depth targets. And a lot of the problems was that the, 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 the depth positions, the artillery, the machine gun positions that the Americans faced, the bombing raids did not succeed against them in the way they did against um, the, the targets in the uh, British and the, and the uh, Canadian beaches respectively. So. That, and that accounted for a high proportion of American casualties. So we only have a, a few minutes left and I, I want to conclude this, although I reiterate my, my apology at the outset, these are two big subjects that, that certainly merit an entire discussion to themselves. I, I want to, to conclude by asking each of you in, in short form, if possible, to talk about the circumstances that engendered this incredible leadership and incredible coordination, not just among the allied powers. And Avisha, I'm going to come to you also to, to talk about that same theme in conclusion. But first, Liam and Richard, not just the, 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 the coordination among the allied powers, but the political leadership with, with Roosevelt and with Churchill respectively. Um, and, and, and also the support that came from the civilian population. I mean, if you read accounts of D-Day, the, the tremendous uh, backwind that came from the civilians in, in Britain prior to the launch is very, very evident, very palpable. And so what accounted for that? And even though I said the large questions, I still want you to tackle them briefly. Could that type of leadership, initiative, coordination and success be brought about today, do you think? And Liam, if you can start with that one, and then you, Richard, and then Avisha, I'm going to conclude with a question, a related question to you. Yeah, I mean, I think so part of it is, right, it's circumstances of the environment. So I think in this case, right, a clearly identified and agreed upon threat that was extremely significant. So anytime you have something like that, I think you can get this international, right, community agree upon, right, if we go to look at the 2003 invasion of Iraq, we couldn't get that same consensus. Why? Because no one, you know, the, the, you know, NATO and others or whatever European partners didn't agree with the same way we perceived the threat. And they were probably right. But in this case, right, if you have that, then you can coalesce and have this massive effort that, right, throughout the entire population, right, not just the military, like we often describe kind of the contemporary wars uh, in Iraq or Afghanistan are really kind of being fought or burdened by, right, the, the intelligence in the military community and the rest really don't think we're at war, you know, over the last 20 years. Uh, so when I think you have that and, that, and as Richard pointed out, that doesn't mean the commanders and the right Churchill and, and Roosevelt agree on how to fight the war. 
they have different agreements, on, different opinions on that, but it really allows you to kind of ha have a singular focus. And that's really what it is a case. So I think it's, uh, it, it is the people. I mean, Churchill and Roosevelt were important, but also having that external environment al allows those leaders to emerge. Thank you, Liam. Richard? Just unmuted myself. Um, I think the, uh, um, the, 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 at the national level, we shouldn't forget what, what these leaders were doing. Um, it wasn't, they weren't just, you know, both Roosevelt and Churchill weren't just trying to defeat the Germans. They were also trying to position themselves for the situation after the war. Um, and, you know, in, in relation in particular to, to Stalin, but in relation to, to Churchill also obviously was interested in doing what he could to preserve the British Empire which he felt was a very important thing. And Roosevelt had different views on that. So there was tension between those three leaders, in particular between Roosevelt and Churchill, on, um, on what the priorities were and where they lay. And, and you know, Churchill, uh, Roosevelt was a very strong leader, very fine leader, Churchill also. And I think Churchill was one of the greatest leaders that we've ever had in history. Um, and, and, and his leadership was borne out, you know, right the way from the very beginning, even before the Second World War begun. And if it hadn't been for the stand he decided to make against the Nazis in 1940, then I don't believe that uh, D-Day would ever have occurred. So I think his resolute leadership and foresightedness from the very beginning was critically important. And I think the other, the other person I mention is, um, is Eisenhower. I've spoken about him a few times, but he was an incredible leader. There's no doubt about it. He, I, I mentioned that there was a dispute about um, where, whether D-Day should go ahead, whether there should be other um, places first. But also, there was a, a major decision was made before D-Day about where the strategic bombing effort should lie. Churchill wanted it to continue to be directed against Germany, and Eisenhower wanted it to be directed against France, and neither was prepared to budge. And so Eisenhower said, well, in that case, I will resign. He felt so strongly about it, and Churchill gave in to him, and the bombing effort was... Change. I think that kind of strong leadership was uh, an important factor. Just finally, um, in relation to today, I think it's very, it's not easy, nothing is easy in these situations, but I think it's much more straightforward to, to be a strong, decisive leader uh, and to bring the people, the population of the country with you when you're facing a very obvious existential threat. I think in wars we've seen since then, and we're likely to see in the future, whether it be wars against jihadists, whether it's wars against China, whether it's wars against Iran, and I don't necessarily mean hot wars in any of those cases. Everything is far less clear and far less certain. And the enemy is, uh, makes a particular, you know, makes particular effort to, to not appear to be like an enemy in some cases, and China being a classic example of that. We've seen how difficult it is to, to keep the population on side when you're fighting wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. And, I, and we've also seen the, the great efforts that the Russians have gone to to, to, to try and appear to be, they're, they're carrying out aggressive action while trying to appear not to be and making it very hard to hit them head on. And so I think that that is the kind of war we're going to see in the future, something that's less well-defined and much less easy for national leaders to, to bring their populations to support. Avishai, I want to round off this conversation by asking you to speak to what was actually a, a, a commonality between D-Day and the Six-Day War. And, and again, it's a large question, but just briefly, if you could, you've got this incredible paragraph here in, in your op-ed, which says, the sense throughout the defense establishment was that if Israel was to avoid what it perceived to be a looming second Holocaust, it must capitalize upon the first opportunity to push back the threats a looming second holocaust now the the landing uh, of the allied forces then pushed on ultimately the nazis were defeated the and and, and the systematic attempted at distraction of the jewish people was interrupted stopped in its tracks thankfully and then comes the state of israel not because of the holocaust but but suddenly is a bulwark against a second holocaust the state of Israel, 
Is the state of Israel a country that now lives in fear of a second Holocaust? Is that mindset one that belongs to days past, to times past? Or does the state of Israel and indeed Great Britain and indeed the United States of America always have to stay vigilant against the possibility of existential threats emanating from parts unknown, uh, but emanating nonetheless? Well, it's a big question, uh, Benjamin. Uh, but let me tell you, let me tell you that we today are a very strong uh, country, econ economy, militarily, and uh, much more than that. But one of the sentences that you you can find in every squadron, in every battalion, in every brigade is never again. And never again it goes back to the day of the Holocaust. It's not the same situation, it's not the same uh, 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 way of thinking, but it's the same promise, never again. Today we have our country, we have the Israel and the Jewish country, and we as a military guy need to assure to each and every Jews around the world, and of course to the people that live in Israel, that the uh, Holocaust will never here again. So uh, tell you that we are afraid of Holocaust today. I, it's not about afraid or scared. It's about building yourself as a strong country, both uh, uh, military, but not just military, of course, uh, a strong relationship with your ally and build your economy, build your young guys, build your future for the young generation in Israel. And remember that your responsibility to defend Israel is not about only the borders today, is about being able to never again deal with Holocaust like that. This is the way we are trained and we are educated. And this is one uh, sentence that each and every soldier in the Israeli military taking with him once he joined the military. This is my yes, answer. Thank you. thank you so very much. On behalf of Rosita, I want to thank each and every one of you. Avishai, Richard, Liam, Liam, Avishai, Richard. It's such a privilege to have you. I feel personally educated by way of the knowledge and the perspective that each of you have imparted. And on behalf of the Miriam Institute, also my great and powerful colleague, Alan Langer, and, and everybody listening, I want to thank you for taking the time to, to be with us today but also to thank the respective personnel of each of the militaries represented on this call who are standing in the gap and watching over the borders even as we convene in order to commemorate some of the most daring and successful military operations in recorded memory. The Six Day War and prior to that, the D-Day landings. Thank you so very much everyone and thank you to our listeners for being with us and we look forward to the next time that we all convene. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys.